All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, What's New in Liquidity 2.7. I'm Taylor Wagoner, the Operations Analyst here at CNCF, and I'll be the host uh, today. We'd like to welcome our presenter, Oliver Gould, the lead creator of Linkerd and CTO at Buoyant. Before we get going, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, first, as an attendee of this webinar, you are not able to speak out loud, but you can communicate with us via the chat and the Q&A box. We ask that if you have questions that you ask in the Q&A box rather than the chat window. Um, so please direct your questions there. Um, this is an official uh, webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please don't add anything to the chat or to the questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and our presenter today. Um, a reminder that the recording and slides will be posted on uh, the CNCF webinar page later this afternoon, um, which is cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Oliver to kick off today's presentation. Thanks, Taylor. Hi, folks. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am Oliver, the creator of Linkerd. Um, and I'm going to go through today uh, some updates about the project in general and specifically in the context of what we just released in 2.7 uh, last month. And then at the end, I'll, I'll update you on the upcoming roadmap and hopefully give a little bit of a demo, um, depending on the time. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, so background of the project, uh, we've been working on this uh, actually, before we started working on Linkerd, so my background was an uh, infrastructure engineer at Twitter working on um, much of the same problems, but in uh, a library-based approach rather than an application-based approach. And that led us to start working on Linkerd in early 2016. And about a year later, um, we donated, the, after getting some production users, we donated the project to, 20, um, to the CNCF, uh, which has been a great home for the project over the past uh, three years now. Um, and then a little in, in the end of 2018, we did a big overhaul of the project, um, moving, sunsetting a lot of the JVM stuff that we started with and moving to a new approach, which is what I'll be discussing mostly today. Uh, so let's start with what Linkerd does or, or why anyone might use it. Uh, so Kubernetes uh, and in general, the, the kind of cloud native approach gives you lots of uh, control and visibility into your workloads and whether they're running and whether they're not and where they come from um, and a lot of the kind of container side of things. What they don't give you is much in terms of the way that traffic, uh, the application is actually behaving in that system. And so that's what, where Linkerd really comes in. And first and foremost, we uh, provide uniform golden metrics across all of your, your application stack. So uh, the success rate, latencies, throughput, error rates, um, you know, a, a wide range array of things. And with that, you can build things like service topologies. So you can view who your callers are and who your colleagues are. Uh, you can instrument distributed tracing and even ad hoc tracing, which I'll talk about um, in a bit. Uh, the other main draw for, for Linkerd is it's automatic uh, security feature set. And so we do things like transparent MTLS and a whole lot there that is uh, really valuable and, and works just out of the box. Um, excuse me, I, I work in San Francisco and there's a, an ambulance outside. Um, additionally, all of that has to work reliably. We, we can't, if you're introducing something like a service mesh, uh, it can't reduce the reliability of your system. In fact, there's lots of opportunities to enhance it. And, and so that's really where Linkerd comes in. And we do that in what we hope is a really operational simple an operationally simple approach. Uh, so quickly, if you're not familiar with the service mesh, which um, I guess there's still people out there who are getting around this, but we've been working on this for a couple of years now. Um, but it, it really comes around uh, the microservice approach. And so the, the distinguishing factor for microservices, the distinguishing trait for microservices is that there are small components that communicate over the network, um, usually in some sort of RPC fashion. Uh, and where the service mesh comes in is that we add a sidecar proxy, uh, what we call the data plane, to every instance of the application. And this allows us to add that functionality we were discussing before. And it's all powered by a control plane. 
Um, and that control plane uh, is you know, responsible for service discovery, as well as uh, powering the visibility system and the observability system and uh, providing policy to the proxies so that they can enhance the application. In Linkerd2, um, this looks somewhat like this. And of course, this is an evolving picture. Uh, but we have um, a set of control plane components that are all written in Go. Um, we did that so we can be tightly coupled with the Kubernetes APIs like client Go. Uh, we vendor, we currently vendor things like Prometheus and Grafana, so we can have an out of the box experience that um, just works. And then we've written a data plane proxy in Rust. Um, and this has been a big part of our investment over the past few years is to build a, a service mesh proxy that's purpose fit for this use case. Um, and then we, we use things like gRPC for all of the communication within the system. Um, so this is really a, a cloud native approach um, as best we can. And as we went into this, we went into this with uh, a lot of lessons from Linkerd1. Uh, and those lessons were that this had to be a, a kind of zero config experience. This needs to be something that you can drop into your Kubernetes cluster uh, without changing the application and start getting value out of it. This can't be a six months to a year, we have to go adopt a service mesh uh, you know, journey. The, this needs to be an incremental thing where we can start to get visibility and start to enhance security uh, while we figure out all the things that we wanna do and can do with the service mesh. Um, part of that being a, a kind of lightweight addition to your cluster means that it has to be really low overhead. Uh, we don't want to be adding a lot of memory overhead um, or CPU overhead, and especially latency. Uh, we, do, we don't want to make your application any worse. Um, and as I said, I think we have opportunities to really improve latency for applications. Uh, and the third tenet of this is that it had to be Kubernetes native. Um, and so we've really made sure that we embrace Kubernetes primitives, uh, that we're not and adding more abstractions on Kubernetes, but are, are building directly into Kubernetes. And with that, we've integrated tightly with the ecosystem um, through things like, you know, having Prometheus working out of the bat since the beginning. Uh, and the control plane we talked about um, is about 200 megs RSS if we ignore the Prometheus component. Um, and that data plane is somewhere between 10 and 20 megs of RSS typically with about one millisecond of P99 latency. And there's a bunch more reading on how we got there um, at those links below, which you can get when this is up online. So exactly how fast and small is it? Uh, well, we did some, we had uh, the folks at Kinvoke run some tests uh, about a year ago. Uh, and so of course, when you have no service mesh at all, when you have no sidecar proxies, uh, you will get the kind of best raw utilization. Um, however, when you do add a service mesh proxy, Linkerd is a great choice here. Uh, or and, and I'm sure that the others will improve, but uh, we've really focused on making this uh, a low overhead as possible. So next I want to walk through um, in more detail what some of these features are. And so when we talk about things like observability or security uh, or reliability for that matter, what, what does that mean and what does that mean for your application? And so first and foremost, what we find is that load balancing is the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with Kubernetes load balancing approaches, but typically the way services work is that this is all managed through IP tables, which means we do connection level load balancing, uh, which is really not an efficient way to do load balancing, especially for modern applications, especially gRPC and HP2 applications, uh, where we have one connection for the whole lifetime of the process typically. And so we really focus on doing request level load balancing. And so that means we can efficiently utilize your Kubernetes deployments. And we, we do this with a latency aware load balancer, what we call a peak Yuma load balancer, which is exponentially weighted moving average. And that allows us to make sure that if you have individual pods in your cluster that are slow because they have noisy neighbors or are failing because of some bad configuration, uh, the proxy is able to eliminate them from consideration for balancing, and we only send traffic to the healthy endpoints. This is all powered by Kubernetes primitives like services. Uh, we're not introducing new service, uh, service discovery complexity on here. 
And again, most importantly, this doesn't require any application change. So just by adding a sidecar proxy, uh, we transparently detect HTTP traffic and load balance it without anyone being the wiser. And this has real effects. Um, this, this isn't just about uh, kind of theoretical performance improvement. Um, here's a test we ran with the various load balancing algorithms, and these are all request level load balancing algorithms still. Um, but we see by switching to a Yuma balancer, we can really improve success rate. And so if you had a, a, a timeout of say one second for your requests, what a Rod, Robin load balancer would do would give you a 95% success rate. By using a better load balancing algorithm, we can push that up around three nines. Uh, which can be the difference between being paged and not paged in many on-call rotations. And so it, it's a really important tool, especially as you deal with uh, scaling your system and, and getting it to scale horizontally. The other kind of really important out-of-the-box feature for Linkerd is that we automatically establish mutual TLS between every node in the mesh. And that's to say, if we have the a sidecar on, on each side of a connection that will all get TLS'd uh, without any application participation. And th that's not really just about encryption. So we talk to folks who say, well, I don't need TLS in my cluster because uh, I trust my cloud provider and uh, you know, I'm not dealing with healthcare data, so it really doesn't need to be encrypted in transit. And that, that might be true, uh, however, TLS gives us more than that. It gives us a, a way to establish identity on the communication level. And so we can actually know which workload is talking to us. And we can know that in a cryptographically verified way. And if you extend this into how your, your provisioning system works, this can actually give us a, be part of a full zero trust uh, communication model. Today, we bootstrap all of this up from Kubernetes service accounts. And so we use, again, Kubernetes primitives and the uh, identity bootstrapping in with, within Kubernetes to bootstrap uh, service mesh identity. And then once we do that, we rotate certificates today, once a day, but I think that could become much more frequent. Uh, and you know, we're, we're again, the, the keys never leave the pod, so there's no uh, central risk there. And then we rotate these things very frequently. And just in 2.7, and so this was the kind of banner feature for 2.7, we made it possible to bootstrap all of this with Cert Manager. So previously, part of the Linkerd installation, it would generate trust routes and do some things for you, uh, but that's not really a great way to run in production where you want to have a real chain of trust around your certificates. And so you, Cert Manager lets you integrate with things like Vault and various cloud providers. And so that's a really exciting addition. Um, it's again, a brand new feature. And we've had a lot of questions about that over the past few weeks. Um, so please come get involved there and tell us what other things you'd like to see in that space, um, because it's a really cool feature. Uh, we do all of this without conflicting or imposing any requirements on your ingress or application TLS. So if you have ingress TLS, uh, we will transparently proxy that through and not decrypt it in the mesh. Same thing for application traffic. And that means also that this mutual TLS is not intended to be used for those things. And um, so if you want to have a TLS at another level, the mesh will proxy it and treat it as raw TCP traffic. If you're communicating in plain text, we'll do all this awesome MTLS things for you. Uh, and today that is just for HTTP and gRPC traffic, um, but we're working on making that feasible for arbitrary protocols and that, that works in flight. And again, uh, like most of our features, no application changes. You don't have to do anything to your code to start participating in this other than add a few annotations to your workloads. Um, this is my favorite Linkerd feature that we never talk about. Um, and I didn't find a good image for it, unfortunately. But uh, another part of the you know, transparent upgrading that we do is that we communicate everything between mesh pods over HTTP2 uh, and again with MTLS. And so what that means is that we, if you have an HTTP application that would typically open many, many connections between pods, we can do all of that over a single connection. That means we can amortize all the costs for TCP handshakes and it means that things like MTLS are not a significant performance overhead because we don't have to do session establishment repeatedly. That happens about 
a few times per process, per, you know, per edge, per po two pods, um, and that's it. And again, no application changes. Nobody knows that HTTP2 is involved from your application's point of view. Uh, so whether you're using HTTP2 or HTTP1, we just merge that all under one big fat pipe, which is great. Uh, now onto some of the visibility features. So um, we've started with Prometheus from the ground up. And this is kind of in direct contrast to the Envoy-based meshes. Envoy did not really start with Prometheus support. They started with StatsD support and have been, in, you know, moving towards Prometheus support for over the past couple of years. Um, this is something we realized was really important for Kubernetes native mesh, and so we started with this. And we do that in order to give every pod in your fleet a uniform level of visibility. And so, regardless of what language is implemented or, or what, you know, whether that's written in-house or uh, third-party software. We can get the same gold metrics. We can get latencies, success rates, request counts, failure counts, um, all of the interesting things about your traffic. Uh, this is HTTP and gRPC aware, and so we know what an HTTP success code is versus a failure code, and the same thing for gRPC. And we, we can annotate the metrics with lots of that metadata. And in addition to that metadata, we pull lots of the Kubernetes workload metadata from the discovery API. And so when your proxy is talking to another pod, we can tell you exactly which pod it's talking to, what service it's part of, and a, a lot of the other Kubernetes-centric metadata there. Uh, we've done work to make sure that we give you raw histograms, which is kind of a maybe esoteric feature. But what this means is that there's no averaging of latencies in the system. If you want to ask about P99 latency across your fleet, we can actually give you a fairly accurate P99 latency rather than the average of P99 latency which is typically what uh, you find in these solutions. This is all can be hydrated with open API and gRPC specs. And so if you happen to be using a, an IDL or a inter a interface definition language, you can use this to configure the metrics so we can give you uh, per route metrics and things like that. Um, again, no application changes. You just upload this data and the proxy will pick it up at runtime and go with it. We've done a bunch of work, I think, last year to um, integrate with Open Census. And this lets us, so if your application uses Open Census with something like Jaeger, uh, Linkerd can participate that. And so here we see in this screen cap that uh, there are, you know, another application running and we can see all of the Linkerd hops in that application. However, this does require application changes. And that is just the nature of distributed tracing like Jaeger. Um, your application has to forward headers and has to do things. And so uh, this is a really cool feature, but it's not within Linkerd's kind of wheelhouse of out of the box awesomeness. However, we do have something that we call TAP, which is an ad hoc tracing feature. And so this can be done without any application change. And the way this works is that at runtime, as your system's running, you can connect to pods through the control plane and say, show me requests that look like this. And we can actually start to collect data from the fleet of pods uh, at runtime um, to give you ad hoc tracing without having to do any application change. Uh, and while that may sound scary from a security point of view, we've done work to make sure this is all uh, RBAC'd and MTLS'd and validated so that uh, you can actually set control over who may tap whom. An another one of our awesome features is traffic split. Um, this is something we've been working with the folks at SMI. And so SMI is a service mesh interface. Uh, we're working with folks from Weave and HashiCorp and uh, Superglue, all, all different groups there, Microsoft, um, to define APIs that are kind of core to the service mesh regardless of implementation. And one of these is traffic split. This allows us to divide traffic between services which lets you do, like, do things like canary or blue-green deployments. Um, and there's some really cool demos around Flagger. And so if that's interesting to you, I would encourage you to go check out their demos. Uh, in addition to just traffic split, um, we also have uh, more APIs in SMI. Traffic telemetry is a uniform way to ask about these metrics independently of the service mesh. And that lets you build things like dashboards on top of this. Uh, whether you're using Linkerd or Istio or any of them. 
And we also have traffic policy, which is uh, still kind of in its alpha state, but is a way to set policies on which endpoints can talk to which services, and et cetera. Okay, um, before I go further, are there any questions in the Q&A uh, that we want to look at? It looks like there may be. Okay. Um, so Deepak asked, uh, when should we sh choose Linkerd over Istio? And I, not, I wasn't planning on talking about that explicitly. Uh, I, I think that Istio is a, a great solution for um, lots of uh, complex policy problems. And I, but I, we do find kind of consistently that folks who adopt Istio take kind of a long time to adopt it. And so if this is part of a, a longer architecture thing where you can really spend the time to get this right and, and really dig in and learn a lot of organizational things, um, Istio is probably a good approach. There's a lot of API surface area there and you can do lots of things. Linkerd's focus on simplicity is meant to unblock you. And so if you're trying to get to Kubernetes today, and you need visibility and security and reliability. Linkerd is something that you can drop in and then we'll grow with you. And so we don't have yet some of the policy features that Istio has, but we, what we focused on is what we think are the essential things that you can't live without. Um, let's see, there are some other questions here. Uh, and I will get, and I think the other question around Linkerd is the same. I'll get back to those questions towards the end. I'm going to take a quick deviation from um, my slides to show a demo, if that's acceptable to everyone. Okay, and so I have taken the liberty of deploying an app in Kubernetes uh, in advance, and it, it's this typical bookstore type application. Um, and I can see that it's all running and healthy, but that's about all I really know about the application. Um, you know, I could probably try to look through logs, but there's not a lot there. And so I, I want to show you what Linkerd can do for this application um, in just a matter of minutes. And so for the first things first, uh, we, I'm going to install Linkerd. And rather than install stable 2.7, I'm going to install the edge release, which we released uh, yesterday. Um, Oh, and I, I kind of skipped over this earlier. We do edge releases weekly. And so we have a, a very kind of uh, regular release process off of master. And then we release stable releases about every two months. And so we, we iterate kind of quickly and then we test and QA the feature set on edge. And then once we feel like we have a stable feature set, uh, we cut a stable release. So we do stable about every two months and, and we, edge is weekly. So I've already upgraded to this week's edge, it seems. And I can verify that. And I don't have a server version yet. And so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, Linkerd. Well, before I install it, I'm going to check my cluster. And so sometimes your Kubernetes cluster can be configured in a way such that Linkerd will not just work in it, unfortunately. And some cloud providers or some bare metal installs are effectively, uh, especially affected by that. So we have this check that this makes us sure that the Cluster is in a good state. And so my AKS cluster here is in a great state. So now I can go ahead and install it. Um, and you can use things like Helm here. Uh, we've done a lot of work to make the Helm integration really good. Uh, I would recommend that if you're going to do something in production. Um, but today, because I'm doing a demo, I'm just going to um, deploy this YOLO style. OK, Linkerd install, Kupital apply F. All right, so we created a couple CRDs and then a whole bunch of config maps and things like that, um, some bunch of role bindings. Uh, this can also be split up so that you can set out the um, role binding, the cluster role things from the user level privileges. And then we'll run Linkerd check, and Linkerd check will again make sure that the cluster starts successfully. Um, and so we validated that all of the kind of configuration and credentials were uploaded properly. And now we're waiting for, well, we're waiting for Prometheus to start. Um, that shouldn't take too long, but we might get impatient. Let's see. OK, there we go. Um, and so that is good. We should run it again, and it will just work. Great. Uh, 
And we see here that we've added, I don't know, 10 small pods to the cluster. Um, and we can try to see stats for them. Oh, the output's not pretty. What we find is that we have a bunch of stats in the Linkerd namespace, but we don't yet in the default namespace. So Linkerd.deploy. Uh, none of, we haven't upgraded the books app or anything yet. All we've done is install Linkerd. Great, and so we see that Linkerd is running successfully, but we have no stats around the books app. So how do we add Linkerd to the books app? Um, well, normally in production, you would go update some YAML file and check it into Git and get that out. Um, for demos, I'm just gonna run this handy dandy hoop cuddle command. And I've annotated the namespace so that Linkerd will be injected to everything in that namespace. And then I can do a hoop rollout restart, deploy, and I just will restart them all. And this will take a couple seconds, probably. And see now where we, we used to have uh, one container per pod, we now see the new pods have two containers. And so we have a sidecar container running with them. And as the container starts up, it generates a private key. And then it talks to the control plane using its service account token to validate its identity and get a certificate. And then at that point, they all start to communicate over TLS. And so if we stat. So we see some of the old things are still in here. Or, okay, now we have data. Um, and we see the traffic thing doesn't have anything because this is all server side stats. So we can go to deploy and we will Okay, now we see the outbound stats from those things as well, which is cool. We see success rates not perfect here. Um, so we can do more introspection here, um, but immediately, so we just, all we've done is add an annotation and restart the pods and we now have traffic data and we can see success rates and we can see latencies. We can see the success rates are not perfect. Um, and so we can do something like Linkerd top, oh, Linkerd top, um, let's say, which one was not healthy? Um, so let's say the web app. Top deploy web app. And now we're using that tap functionality, that ad hoc tracing functionality to connect to the web app process and to start to look at exactly which requests are, are running. And so we see the latencies and the counts of these things here. Um, we can also use things like Linkerd tap. And this will just dump out raw request metadata. We can do, I think, yeah, we can get really high granularity JSON structured data here. So you can start to script over this stuff if you want to. Uh, there's some cool JQ things you can do there for sure. Um, and then there, there's a, oh, there's a bunch more in the CLI, but before we go further, um, this edges command will actually allow us to start to see who is communicating with whom and whether it's secure or not. And so we see this one case, the web, the traffic pod had talked to an old web pod before it had any identity to it. And so there was no security there, no TLS there, but everything else, all the other communications has been secured now, which is awesome. Um, before I put this demo down, let's just open the dashboard. It's not just a CLI tool. Uh, we have a really nice web dashboard for all this stuff. And so maybe here we'll get a better sense of what's going on. So one, we can get uh, topologies. Um, people think incorrectly that you need tracing to get topologies. Uh, we can do this all just with Linkerd's metrics because we've annotated it with rich metadata. Uh, we can also click into the books app. And when we click the books app, we again see its upstream and downstream services and their success rates. And we also can get a big live view of the calls and actually which calls are failing. So I can see that hosting to books.json is really where our success problems are. Also this one, reading this one book is a little hard too. Uh, and that gives us a lot of actionable data. Now I can actually go start to debug things. And we have the same sort of, you know, the same set of features that we have in the CLI or in the UI as well. 
Okay. Um, and so back to the slide deck. Um, well, for, let, actually, let's stop before we go further there. Any, any more questions about what we just saw? There might be some more things in the QA. Um, okay. Uh, and I'll come back to the questions in a sec. But uh, the roadmap coming up. Um, so in 2.7, we just shipped a bunch of cert manager features. Uh, 2.8 is coming up hopefully towards the end of the month. It was going to be after KubeCon, but without KubeCon, we might get it done earlier. Uh, and that is going to be a bunch of stability improvements and, and perf improvements, um, as well as I mentioned earlier that it can be quite uh, large, or the Prometheus instance can become quite large in production. And so most folks tend to have their own Prometheus installs and don't want to duplicate that with ours. And so we're working on making that something where other folks can just plug their Prometheus into Linkerd and we don't have to ship it, uh, run a second one. Um, that'll be really cool. A much bigger project we just started on is multi-cluster. And so that will allow us to start bridging clusters and doing cross-cluster routing and policy, which is super exciting. Uh, we've just shipped some of the first pieces of that into the, into the code base, but that'll be slowly rolling out over the next couple stable releases. It's a great time to come get involved with that. And uh, we've written some blog posts on parts of that that we understand well. And so if that's exciting to you, uh, please get in touch because there's a lot more to talk about there. Uh, a lot of my focus right now is on getting MTLs for everything. And so I said we did HTTP and gRPC by default, and I want to extend that to be all TCP traffic that we automatically MTLS it. Um, that will allow us to start doing things like traffic policy in a much better way. And so uh, that's happening soon. I'm, I'm expecting it in the 2.9 timeframe, the next set of features there. And we're working kind of steadily towards implementing the SMI traffic policy APIs. Additionally, we, we get requests for exotic protocol support, things like Kafka and Redis, um, and other things I'm sure. And so this is a big opportunity where I'm looking for folks to help contribute these things to the, to the code. Um, it's not technically challenging. It's really just figuring out what the value proposition is for each of these uh, various protocols and helping us, uh, working with us to, to integrate that into the system. And um, all of this is on GitHub. All of this is open source. Uh, we have a ton of contributors from a ton of organizations. And so um, if this is something that appeals to you we, and we are lacking a feature or, or lacking docs that you think we need, please come get involved and ask questions. Uh, we're just in the process of launching a new RFC process. And so the intent here is that it will make it easier for folks we're not kind of integrated well with the project already to start proposing bigger changes. Uh, we find that some folks will just kind of walk into issues and, and want to think through large uh, new features. And we think an RFC process is a little bit a more structured way to deal with that. We have a great community on Slack, uh, lots of questions and lots of people answering questions. So I, I encourage you to join our Slack. We have mailing lists. They're not so active, but they're good for information. We do pre regular periodic uh, community calls. And we've done things like formal security audits. Uh, Cure 53 did a really great audit of our code base uh, last year. And we're working with the community right now to do some auditing of the underlying TLS infrastructure that we use, which is really, really exciting. And um, couldn't do it without the CNCF, that's for sure. OK, and all that said, um, I think I've talked enough in a big stream of thoughts, but I, hopefully there's some more questions now. Um, Paul wants to know if we're hiring. Um, that's a good question. We, uh, we're always opportunistically hiring the right people uh, for, for needs that we have. Um, so talk to us. But uh, I, I expect we'll be hiring more um, later in the year or next year after some of um, Boyan's business things progress. Um, but stay in touch for sure. Um, Print asks, how do we export the configs to vigil style deployments? I'm not sure I understand what a vigil style deployment is, um, but I'm, I'm willing to learn. <laughs> and uh, Deepas asks, so many, or actually, in which case is it not a good idea as a service mesh? Does cost play a role in uh, any role in this decision? And that's a really good question. And I, I could probably talk for 40 minutes on, on that. 
I think the short answer is that um, all mature microservices end up having something like a service mesh. The question is whether it's decoupled from the application itself or whether it's integrated as a library. And so um, when I was at Twitter working on this, we used Finagle, which was a library, uh, but it was effectively a service mesh. It's a rich data plane. Uh, it's a you know, smart data plane that knows how to talk to uh, service discovery, that knows how to learn uh, timeouts and policy information and all that stuff and apply it to the data path. And so it's inevitable that you end up with something like that in a sophisticated microservice or, or really any microservice. Um, and the cost then becomes whether you have the control to have a uniform code base and you have the engineers to uh, maintain that infrastructure or whether it makes more sense to bring this in as a separate component that can be layered in. And so that's really the cost trade-off that has to be uh, assessed there. My hunch is that in the majority of cases um, where you do not have an existing uh, data plane solution, a service mesh is going to be a cheaper approach in the long run in terms of staffing, especially. Um, those things can be quite complex. And if you have an extremely uniform service, um, you know, you may be able to get away with it, but those things don't last forever. Um, oh, wait, okay, so Trip is asking about uh, GitOps style deployments. And so, yes, that's a big focus of ours right now. Um, we have been focused on uh, one nice that Helm integration. So Helm is kind of the, the de facto standard there right now. I, we think that there's a lot of other opportunities for, you know, in, doing more integrations there. Um, but for instance, the cert manager integrations that we did in 2.7 were done specifically so that we could support GitHub style workflows where we don't want folks to have to check in Linkerd's uh, signing credentials. We want them to be managed by an external system. So um, cert manager is a big part of that. And so, uh, yeah, we expect that to work very well. If you find problems or have questions, uh, come into Slack or GitHub. Um, we'd love to help you solve them. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, I'm about out of uh, good answers, unless there are easier questions. I, I don't know much about um, identity aware proxying. Um, the, I think, so I think reading into Deepak's question here is with so many security services like Cloud Armor, IAP, identity or proxy, how does this using a service mesh like Linkerd help in securing the traffic? And I would view those as multi different layers in the same, um, in, in a complete solution. And so Linkerd is not really focused on dealing with kind of uh, ingress or user facing traffic in any way. And we of course have to proxy some of it, but we view that as mostly forwarding TCP connections to an ingress. And we want there to be smart ingresses that deal with um, OAuth and the various authentication systems that you may need there. Where we see a service mesh really coming in is in the workload to workload, service to service communication. And how do we uh, extend the identity model to deal with services and not just people. And so I, I view them both as kind of essential components in a zero trust solution. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, and if there are no new questions popping up, I think I have exhausted my voice. Oh, a question from Vivian. Uh, is it possible to expose LinkedIn metrics without the use of internal Prometheus metrics in current version 2.7, or will this be part of the next release? Uh, so Linkerd's metrics are uh, automatically exposed from the proxies themselves. And so you're always able to connect to the proxies on port 4191 and curl the slash metrics endpoint and you'll get all the Prometheus metrics you want from there. So you don't need a Prometheus installation to get metrics out of the system. Um, to be able to use our dashboards or run Linkerd stat or any of those commands that I demo today, Prometheus is a necessary component. And so a lot of the workflow that we expect, we need something like Prometheus. Um, but you, know, you can hack it yourself, I'm sure. It's all open source.
Okay, another question from Bailey Hayes. Uh, you've called out Helm several times. Is the plan for GitOps changes or will, will it be customized? Um, that's a good question. I, I think we're, we are looking for people who are customized experts to come help us fill out that story. And so these are all, um, I, I don't think Linkerd has too much of a, a horse in the game of how you do installs. We want to make sure that we have kind of the generics exposed so that it's possible to go do anything you want. Um, I know uh, Thomas, who works with us, um, has done some stuff with Customize here, but I, I just don't know enough about it to, to know. But I, I would love folks in the community to come and get involved there and show us some good recommendations. I'd also point out that uh, last week we saw a demo from someone using Terraform to manage these things. And so it's not just Helm. Um, it can be done in lots of different ways. But uh, we're looking for community solutions there for, for a large part of it. Good question, Joe. Um, oh, great. More and more questions. I love this. Uh, if the Kubernetes cluster uses Calico for networking, does Linkerd support it? Yes, uh, we have a CNI and we can integrate. We work well with other CNIs. Um, and so there's no blockers there. Um, let us know if you find any issues. And is there a guide you can follow which, uh, if we are running, a, running Linkerd in large uh, deployments? Um, 3,000 plus pods, scaling the control plane. Um, there are, I, I, I don't know, there probably are some things on the internet around that. Um, however, I will also add that companies like Buoyant, which I work at, do uh, offer support for very special installations um, and things that need a little higher touch. Um, so if, if that's not appealing to you, I would say let's get come to the to the GitHub or Slack and start the questions there. And we can find folks in the community who can who have been through some of these things and can help you. Um, yeah, we're, we're not a, a top down community we're, there's a lot of folks figuring these things out uh, on the ground with us. So use them and not just us or not just me. Um, okay, I, I think we're we're Taylor correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're roughly good on time here. Yes, great. We're, we're great on time. Are there any last questions from anybody in the audience? Vivian has a question. I have been using hooks to replace CA cert when installing using Helm. Will there be support for rotate CA certs? Uh, so that's a hot topic of conversation. That's a really good question. Um, I am going to probably ask you to take that offline and come to Slack or, or GitHub where um, there, there are multiple schools of thought on that. And we want to help your use case. Uh, we there are some security concerns around making the CA rotation easy, and so we're trying to balance the, the security risks there with the um, difficulties around managing these configs. Any other questions before I go? And again, come to Slack or GitHub, and uh, you'll find us there too. Uh, we have community meetings uh, probably towards the end of March. Any clients I can mention? Um, so I will go back uh, on, oh, that's not what I meant to do. On the uh, users, um, up here we have a bunch of uh, big slides with folks who are using Linkerd. Some of these are Linkerd 1, but many of them are Linkerd 2. Um, I, other than these that are up here, I don't want to out anyone, anyone's infrastructure plans. Uh, but again, I think if you come into Slack, you'll find people at various companies who are, are happy to talk about what they're doing. Uh, and Kelly Burr is another really good question. Any thoughts on giving Linkerd the ability to have an intermediate cert with a private key so it can man in the middle and inspect traffic for services that have to be TLS end to end like Elasticsearch? That is a fantastic question. Um, there's someone on the team who really, really wants to do it. Uh, it kind of scares me because it's a, a little bit uh, mischievous, but I think that'd be a really cool issue or an RFC to open up. So if that's something that's interesting to you, um, I'm not going to say no to it. It's just uh, we haven't done it yet. Uh, 
Good questions. Really good questions, folks. Okay, I think the questions have stopped. I agree. Thanks everybody for all your good, great questions and Oliver for an awesome presentation. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, the, the webinar recording and slides will be on later online later today at cncf.io slash webinar if you'd like to download the slides and check them out yourself. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone at a future CNCF webinar. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Oliver. Bye-bye. Thanks.